that's compromising. I'm not talking about compromising my values. I'm talking about compromising in a si situation so that I can get done. Sorry, I saw no, that. No, okay. I mean, I completely agree. <laughs> yes, um, Making life difficult yeah. for the editors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, welcome to Beyond the Ballot Box with me, Dashran Johan. This is our Road to GE series, a show that explores your power in deciding who serves you in government and how that could change your life. On today's episode, we're going to be exploring ideologies and manifestos. What are they and should you, um, you know, the regular electoral uh, electorate, um, the regular right, yeah, should you familiarize yourself with a party's ideology and manifesto before deciding which party you'd like to cast your vote for? So joining me on the show to discuss this are two people who I think are very uh, important people like people i like to discuss with when it comes to these this particular topic ideologies and manifesto and on one hand we have howard lee he's the adon for pase pinji and the member of the dap as well as arvin kadir chelvan he's the youth chief of party socialist malaysia welcome to the show guys how are y'all doing Good. Long time no see in physical. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm good too. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, this is the first time I'll be talking to y'all in person. I think in two years I've been talking to y'all, but this is the first time in person. So really excited for that. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Um, I want to throw it to you first, Howard. Um, when you think of a, an ideology, a political ideology, what is it? And is it important for a political party to have an ideology? Um, first, firstly, I think it's very, very, very important. Uh, there should be no political party without. That, sorry, there should be no political party that uh, does not have a, uh, an ideology. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we see a lot of parties uh, getting into the electoral field just because they fill a particular uh, voter segmentation, and by virtue of that, they get votes. Uh, but uh, political parties and politics in general is about representation and uh, representation of a class, representation of a group of people or a demography. And there is generally the needs of these uh, people that gets and should be represented in the political field. And when you represent them, there needs to be a certain direction or a certain uh, in, in, in Malay or a certain uh, North Star, a certain compass that one needs to base their offerings from uh, and ideology is that uh, and if there's a political party that just kind of swings from one side to the other uh, by virtue of what those people need at that particular time uh, then it kind of defeats the whole point of having representation in the political field by virtue of a political party so uh, my view is my stand is uh, there must always be a political ideological leaning of a group, whether it's a political party or uh, or a politician. Right. Uh, so yeah, that's my stand. Yeah, Arvin, what do you think? Um, largely, I agree with Howard. Uh, a political ideology essentially is a basic set of values, uh, where you stand and uh, uh, how that informs uh, how you view the world and how it should be. Uh, and that's not just for parties, it's only also for movements, for individuals, everyone. Marx also additionally said that uh, the prevailing ideas of society at a time are generally reflecting the ruling class. Right. Uh, and right now, the uh, the ruling class is capitalist. So if a movement individual or political party, in a sense, does not have an ideology, it is not that they do not conform to an ideology, they are still moved by the prevailing ideology of society, which is capitalism. So to all the parties out there who don't have an ideology, surprise, you do, and it is the status quo. Right. So now you brought up um, Karl Marx. You also mentioned capitalism, right? Um, and then when, when we look at political, the political spectrum, um, we're talking about things like capitalism. Um, people also like to use a leftist, right wing, um, centuries and, and things like that. Um, Arvin, do you think these terms are still useful today um, when it comes to, uh, it's, is it still a useful way of categorizing ideological positions? Um, more so, especially when we zoom in on Malaysia. What mm -hmm. are your thoughts? I think it's not just for Malaysia, but for the whole world, it is very useful, essentially, at least to know uh, in what general direction a movement is aligned to. 
So I'll give short definitions for each. Uh, right wing uh, refers to ideologies that are in support of capitalism. So we call them capitalist ideologies. Left wing generally uh, usually are socialist ideologies. Center we'll get to later. Uh, the capitalist ideologies uh, seek to preserve the status quo, uh, how the society is now. They say it is okay for the tools that we need to th- make the things that we need to survive. Uh, what we call the means of production. Right. They, if they are owned by individuals or private entities, that is fine. So if you want bread, you need land, machinery, you need factories to create the bread. All of those things, if they are owned by private hands, it is completely okay. What happens is, now you have a class of people who own everything that you need to create the things that you need. You have, you have a class of people that own all the factories there to create bread. The people majority of people who don't own that are forced to go to these small group of people and expend the only thing that they have, which is labor, become workers. And that's how the whole employer-employee relation has uh, taken place. So the bread that is produced, of course, is going to sell it in the marketplace at a higher price than the raw goods, right? So that difference in price is what we call profit. Right. That profit is taken mostly by the capitalist and a sliver, a small amount is given to the worker. Capitalists say this is fine. Capitalist supporters say this is fine. Socialists say, actually, it's the labor of the worker that created the bread. Flour Mm. doesn't magically become bread. So how come the laborer does not get a say in how the profits are used? Right. That is the primary crux uh, with which the uh, left-wing states that the current way the society is uh, structured now is illogical. It is... If we must move forward to own all of the tools that we uh, need to produce the things that we need collectively so that we can produce things that we need. We can trade with each other. And when we trade the profits that we got, we can all decide together on what to do with it. Democratization, essentially. Centrists uh, think they are above uh, these two and uh, they are above ideology in the first place. But as I said, as Marx said so many years ago, they are still moved by the prevailing ideology of today, which is capitalism. And we must uh, be wary of uh, people who state that and uh, look at them for what they are, essentially. Howard, um, Arvind broke down, you know, what leftists means, what people on the right wing mean, um, what their philosophy are and things like that. Um, what is your take on these ideologies? And also, I want to get your thoughts on, do you think as the masses, um, the regular right, yeah, do you think they should learn and familiarize themselves with these terms? Will it be helpful for them? Um, let's make it clear. What should happen is, by and large, most of the time, not what actually happens. Right. Okay. <laughs> let's, put that, let's make that clear first. Uh, yes, I think, um, especially when you're talking about political uh, discussions, uh, when you enter, when one enters oneself into political debate, uh, having that kind of, uh, I would say, cultural history, not political history, but the cultural history behind the political lexicon that right. is used, uh, term left, right, etc., etc. Uh, I think that's important to have that as a background. Uh, but I think very often a lot of that gets kind of muddled in the muddy waters that are quite muddy nowadays. Uh, because what's left and, and what's right has over the years Uh, have become very identity-based. Now, uh, many of us are not proponents of uh, identity politics. Uh, So the so-called well-known Malay politics versus non-Malay politics in Malaysia, uh, you know, uh, political Islam versus uh, those who are secularists in Malaysia. And it's also become a bit of a left politics or left politicians versus right politicians. Uh, now, I would always, uh, I may not agree, uh, uh, but I would always put myself on the left of the political spectrum right. in terms of my own uh, inclinations, my own political beliefs. I'm a social democrat, which is centered to the left. Um, that's where I stand. But I'm, gonna, I'm not going to throw it in people's faces. I'm not going <laughs> to judge people uh, who are not aligned with me, uh, who are not on the same side. In fact, quite the opposite. I want to hear people on the other side of this centrist line. And I'm not going to judge people for being on the center. 
probably because they don't understand. And I think it's a bit judgmental right. to say that people are not who I am. People are not aligned with me just because they don't understand. Because most of the time it is because they don't understand. Uh, but I think I don't put myself in a position whereby I push people into this kind of uh, confrontational uh, ident political identity right. fight. Uh, that's That's number one. The last point on this particular question is, I think um, to understand the different lexicons, the different cultural uh, kind of framing of political left, the political right, political center, all this enables people to be more informed in making a decision as to what they want rather than what should be because I started this intervention with what should be is often not what happens. Right. So what they want. And when you know what you want, you know what to push for. You know what to champion for. You know what to work towards. You know what to demand in the democratic field, which are where Arvind and I are both in agreement. I mean, democratization is something that we need to go more towards. Uh, but there is a catch, the catch, a negative catch. Democracy sometimes can be a painful sting because when people are prevailing towards the status quo, they want the status quo. The status quo tells them to lean on the side of capitalism. What then? Right. So what do we make of people or politicians or political parties who, when questioned um, about their ideology, say, we don't need to focus on ideology. That's not important. We are a mm. non-ideological party. Mm. Um, we want to just focus on helping the rakyat, uh, whatever that means. Um, why, why do you think this is? Because we've seen even on a global stage and even in Malaysia, um, nowadays parties like, I, I'm not left, I'm not right, I'm upwards, mm. you know, things like that. We've, we've seen these kind of things. Why do you think that is? And can a political party function without having a political ideology? Howard? Yes, they can and they do, unfortunately. <laughs> um, it's because people don't understand. Right. Uh, again, it's a bit judgmental, it's a bit patronizing even. Uh, but actually, the prevailing conditions of the, the human race, or at least within Malaysia, Malaysians in general, by and large, say seven, or eight, uh, seven to eight out of ten people are suffering from the economic conditions that we all see with our own eyes. Right. It's reported in the news. We feel it ourselves in our bank accounts as well as the people that we are close to and love, right? Uh, things are not good. Right. Things ain't great. But at the same time, if you go and speak to someone who is right at the top end of the uh, the predator and, predator and prey scale of the economic realities of Malaysia, those right at the top of the scale are saying things have never been better <laughs> because they're able to eat up right. uh, whatever there is out there at a much lower price with their largely stocked up capital. So um, the, the realities are very different depending on where you are. Now, at the same time, going from an ideological position, do we want to say, just get rid of all these rich people? Well, firstly, you're not gonna succeed. Secondly, do you want to get them on side so that they can use their capital and their capacities and capabilities to help the rest by taxing them, by convincing them that their money can be used to help the rest of the country so that they can strengthen and widen the consumption pool so that, that in the end they will profit maybe slightly less now but slightly more in the future. You know, leave the carrot dangling so that they do what society needs, you know. Right. Uh, but they essentially don't talk about conning them to spend more to tax them more, but actually ask them to participate in making the society a better place. That's social democracy. Uh, now, there are comrades within the progressive and the left movement who would say that, no, we get rid of them. Do we agree with that? I don't. But right. there are some friends who are ideologically aligned with me who would say, get rid of them. Take their wealth. Plant it where the people want it and need it. I disagree with that because an eye for an eye makes the world go blind, number one. Number two, when you kill one person, it makes it easier to kill a hundred. When it's easy to kill a hundred, then it's easy to kill, well, everyone. Right. So that's a interesting um, way of looking at it, right, um, Arvind? So mm -hmm. I want to get your thoughts because I think, um, uh, you know, Howard sort of uh, segued into the next question that I wanted to ask, sure. which is what exactly, just because now you all broke down what political ideologies are, sure. 
Um, just to have uh, you know, paint a clearer picture for listeners who may not be familiar with these ideologies. Now, both of your parties, uh, whether it's Party Socialist Malaysia or DAP, um, are parties that say they are you know that lean towards the left, right? Um, so tell me, what's the difference between um your party's ideology, uh, Arvin, and then later I'll get uh, Howard to talk about a little bit more about social democracy as well. Sure thing. I think uh, the main difference is uh, PSM is is a materialist party and we are realistic. Uh, we do not think that you can go to a rich man and convince him to give more of his wealth away without there being proper structural changes uh, that empower the masses. We are a socialist party. We are uh, aligned to the Marxist uh, alignment. What we want is a uh, equal di- equal distribution of wealth uh, and uh, we want a democratized uh, nation uh, free of exploitation and I also mean economic exploitation uh, through this uh, employee-employee relationship. But the structures that are built uh, now, the structures that have been built by capitalism and strengthened by people like Howard who want to be friends with the rich man, um, they generally... I just don't want to make enemies of them. Uh, that's that's a key difference. <laughs> it's not the same. No, it's, it's, I'm, I'm not going to be your enemy, but it doesn't mean I'm friends with you or not friends with you. I well, just don't want to make an enemy of you. Well, it's like this. You know, you're in a river and uh, what we're doing is uh, going against the tide of the river, capitalism. Howard wants to maybe slow down a bit, but you're going to be carried away by uh, the river in the end. But let me come back to so, uh, to uh, PSM. La. Right. So uh, what we uh, want to do is build alternative uh, power structures. And uh, we successfully do that by organizing the masses into working groups and fighting for their rights. Uh, we have this uh, front called Gabungan Marhain. Uh, Marhain means the proletariat or the underclass, where we uh, work together with the people who are most affected and uh, win all sorts of things, hundreds of houses, millions of ringgit in backdated wages, land for our farmers, I wish you know he's in Pera, uh, land for our orang asli comrades, and this structure works. Why? Because we empower the Marhain. We do not have blind faith that uh, the structures that exist now are going to exist, uh, are going to benefit the rakyat. We are uh, fundamentally changing the basis that has uh, caused this exploitation. And on top of that, we also do uh, other things. You know, uh, we empower, we fight for the rights of the marginalized, the OKU community, the LGBTQ plus community, possibly the only party that does so, um, uh, refugee comrades, migrant comrades. Uh, we fight against the privatization of uh, essential goods like healthcare, uh, where we are opposed to healthcare tourism and want to build uh, public healthcare. So all of these things are fundamental needs that we have identified. Uh, and we will not compromise on them. Right. So that's the essential difference. Howard, um, Arvin took some jabs at you right there. Um, you know, so Arvin, you know, and PSM as a whole, um, they are unabashedly, um, you know, left in that mm. sense. Um, they and they are op- they say that you know they look up to people like Karl Marx and and they follow in the, um, his philosophies and things like that. So what does a party like DAP, who claims to be a social, demo- a social democrat, social democracy, what is your ideology and how is it? Because at the end of the day, both of y'all fall towards the left, right? So it's about the varying degrees of left that mm-hmm. y'all are. So talk to me a bit more about social democracy. How is it different from what Arvin is saying? You know, there's always this uh, running joke uh, amongst progressive parties throughout the world that uh, what happens when you put two socialists in a room? (laughs) Not a party. (laughs) It's called a fight. (laughs) So, (laughs) but I mean, for me, uh, let let me just start with, uh, I don't want to talk about my own position. Uh, I want to talk about my party first. Um, It's freedom, justice, solidarity and democracy. These are the four key pillars. Uh, and the democracy part is a smaller pillar than the other three. Why? Democracy is a structure. Um, the, the the rest are values. So the values in which we push for have to be worked within a structure, in a democratic structure, which, again, in my previous intervention, democracy sometimes hampers right. the realization of these values uh, being inculcated or even practiced in 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 a in, in a system. So uh, just on freedom, uh, I think I've done this in F- uh, BFM before, but uh, freedom is freedom to be uh, what one wants to be. Alamax, uh, freedom from 
uh, well, people wanted to take stuff away from you. Freedom from people imposing stuff that you don't want imposed upon you. Freedom from essentially being forced to do what you don't want to do. Right. So it's freedom from this kind of positive and negative rights. Uh, it's it's freedom. It's freedom that is fundamentally the basis of our beings as humans that separates us from uh, other beings, sentient beings in this world. Freedom. Uh, and would like to extend that to you know animals too, actually. So justice, what's justice? Well, this is where it becomes a little bit murky, mm -hmm. right? Uh, is someone who's really, 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 really rich um, allowed the justice that he or she she's as justice? Yes, should be, but sometimes uh, certain range or certain um, workers, certain representatives within the movement will say that the richer you are, the less justice that you deserve, right? Uh, because you've taken justice away from others, so therefore you deserve less. Right. Uh, I, don't, I don't agree with that because justice is justice and justice needs to be universal, but justice is what is just. What is uh, val uh, the value in which right in accordance to everything within freedom, justice, solidarity and democracy? Solidarity. What solidarity? Well, actually, the rich needs to help the poor. It's as simple right. as that. Uh, and the poor, who has a better uh, view of the world, who is with and know more people uh, that are represented in this world, so the underclass, the proletariat, um, you know, there are more together, so therefore we represent more of the world, need to have a, be have a better insight that needs to be communicated to the bourgeoisie. So therefore, uh, the proletariat needs to tell them and educate those who are rich, right? So I'm trying to turn the other thing, the thing right. around. Uh, but democracy, well, it's, it's about demos and kratos, the, the power of the people, the mm -hmm. majority of the people or not, or all people, which then goes back to that identity of this versus the other. This needs to work with that because, well, both are inextricably linked. Right. And we are living in a time and an age where those who are in the middle, the middling sorts, those who um, literally live in this space between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the middling sorts is increasing. So, and you know, the final point I want, I want to bring is, you know, people who were earning better or higher wages uh, 15, 20 years ago, now in their 80s, 70s, uh, who have used up all uh, their savings because of a lack of a decent welfare state, a uh, lack of a decent pension structure. People who fall behind blind spots of, you know, aged care or the lack of an aged care policy and, you know, taking into account that Malaysia is now an aging nation or nearly an aged nation. Right. My state is already an aging state. Uh, with over 7%, uh, over 65, Malaysia's going to have over 17% of the entire population over 80. That's right. Who is going to take care of their needs when the pension fund run, runs out? Are we going to, and how are we going to address uh, this policy blind spot? Why are we not doing it now? Now, that's the kind of things, and we need to be able to leverage on some of this pro or seemingly capitalist policies out there to leverage on capital out there to ensure these people are taken care of. Right. We're not going to say we're going to throw the entire capitalist structure away because we need to leverage on that to make sure those before the transition happens, we need to leverage on these instruments to help those in need now. So that's a little bit of a roundabout way of explaining my stand? No, I think both of y'all did a good job in painting uh, what exactly ideologies are, right? Mm. And I'm glad that two socialists are in a room and there was no fighting that broke <laughs> that broke out. <laughs> um, let's pivot into something that is perhaps uh, more um, uh, easy to di uh, perhaps easy more to easy to digest, um, especially by the general masses. And I'm talking about manifestos. Mm -hmm. So Arvin, what exactly is an election manifesto? Election manifesto is simply a set of promises uh, that uh, a party, an individual, uh, gives to uh, his or their potential electorate uh, 
and it generally contains uh, short term works to be done immediately and a long term vision essentially uh, that in a nutshell is what a manifesto is lah right um i think there's not much debate there as to what exactly a manifesto is but how would um do manifestos need to be in line with a party's ideology absolutely um now um i've got two different answers to this one question okay uh number one the dap if we were to enter the electoral field on our own without coalescing with another party we will definitely have a uh, i would say a manifesto that is fairly kind of 70 80% in line with psms right. probably mm-hmm. uh of course we do have uh, a membership base that is quite wide so it may not be fully mm. fully left you know right. you're going to have some liberal democrats who kind of broke the the <laughs> broke the glass ceiling on the and and managed to get in right. who will champion for that mm-hmm. uh, for some kind of center right policies mm-hmm. uh and that's the nature of social democrat i mean we are welcoming of people on the other side as long as you you see the value of freedom justice and uh, solidarity right uh but for me if dap was on our own we will have a very very center to the left uh overtly uh kind of social democratic manifesto right but we're not mm-hmm. we're part of a coalition a coalition that it is absolutely a political needs and political necessity to be part of a uh a coalition i make no I, there is no shame in saying that because you need to look at the larger objective the, the larger objective is to remove a power that has been corrupt and is corrupted as inherently corrupt you want to remove that power so therefore you need to gather all your political powers and forces together to be able to make that removal right so therefore we're getting together with parties that may not necessarily and fully are aligned ideologically which makes it a larger spectrum of policies to cover which sometimes there are certain items 1 10 100 10 15 20% that actually you know actually we are at loggerheads with each other right. which is what's happening right now uh there is a manifesto committee of which all four parties within pakatan harapan are sitting together literally every week arguing and those argue- <laughs> arguments are momentous and monumental um you know tables are slammed and rooms are, are left and doors are also slammed and broken sometimes but the fact is those really heated arguments somehow somewhat is a mirror of what happens in governance and in governing a country uh where you have to come up you have to argue and then you have to come up with a consensus or a, a majoritarian agreement as to what to put on the table what happens after you win power with what you produce is a, another matter because we have had some very sore very painful experience where well you go in as four parties the remaining three the, the three parties out of the four say let's go forth and just make sure everything that we promised happen and then you have one party out of the four who says well uh, manifesto bukan kitab suci so you have that problem and you have to face the consequences of that and we're facing that now Hold that thought Howard because I do want to circle back and ask about you know manifesto bukan kitab suci. Um but Arvin mm-hmm. um you know these days when when we look at Malaysian politics mm. um broadly right um it's still not a political sphere where there's a lot of robust policy discussions happening all the time there is um i'm talking about the masses let's say on twitter and all you do see some kind of policy arguments but i'm saying generally people are still stuck on like race based sort of issues and identity politics in that sense do you think people should leave that behind and start focusing on manifestos i have a slight disagreement you mm-hmm. know so i mean we are perpetually online so we yep. see a lot of uh, arguments on twitter mm-hmm. um, but when uh, psm goes on the ground and we talk uh, to the marhain mm-hmm. who are affected they understand their problems mm-hmm. <clears throat> my apologies they understand their problems and they understand somewhat of a solution to move forward right. basically so we shouldn't uh, look down on our our uh, masses in that way lah mm-hmm. basically um largely the the issue is the loudest uh, and the most well funded um uh, ideologies out there uh, are the ones who are shaping the narrative uh and so that's what we see around uh, around lah 
but as I said before, when we build the solidarity of the Marhain, when we build the these working groups that we are building in PSM, we can achieve uh, the the needs of the masses very directly, even without representatives in parliament or any don. So I would say that, um, yeah, manifestos is one thing, but ideas don't come from thin air, you know, they don't come from, you know, closed boardrooms or anything. They come from the masses. Right. You need to be with the masses. You need to understand uh, where what their needs are. And then you need to formulate uh, your, your plans after that, essentially. I agree that the masses know their problems. But it sometimes feels like, like you said, mm. um, you know, whether it is... Uh, you know, well-funded propaganda, mm. brainwashing and things like that, it sometimes turns into this ugly identity politics battle. Mm-hmm. Do you think that people should focus on manifestos? I'm, I'm wondering how mm. important are manifestos in the grand scheme of things? Manifestos are the end product of a long process. You know, you don't come up with a manifesto and then ex- expect people to pay attention to it. The structures that distract them away from the manifesto are still there. If you're not doing the work uh, to, uh, what do you call to educate the masses away from this propaganda, then the manifesto that you create is not going to be uh, accepted. Right. That is a bitter pill that we have to swallow, you know. Um, but yeah, so that's the thing. The work is fundamentally more important uh, than the manifesto. Manifesto is still important. I'm not saying it's not. We write so many manifestos in right. PSM. For Johor, we mm-hmm. did one seat, we had two uh, manifestos. Right. Uh, but uh, the manifesto is a coalescing, co- uh, is ideas coalescing. And it is in the generation of those ideas is the main work, essentially. Right. How would, you know, you, you, you brought up the very, um, you know, infamous uh, manifesto, Bukan Kitab Suci, um, sort of um, ideas among some members of Pakatan Harapan um, back in after GE14. And, you know, Tun Dr. Mahade mentioned that the Harapan Manifesto cannot be fulfilled in its entirety um, as it was crafted with the assumption that Pakatan Harapan would lose or with the assumption that Barisa National would win. Um, you're talking about po- promises like uh, the abolition of tolls, some sedition act and, and many other uh, manifesto promises. Essentially, from what I gather, Tun M implied that the manifesto wasn't pragmatic, the manifesto that Pakatan Harapan themselves came up with and was designed not to be fulfilled, but just to galvanize the electorate. What are your thoughts on Tun M's perspective, especially when we, we talk about how manifestos are essentially a list of promises that you're telling the people before an election? To galvanize the base and to have it designed in a way that's deliverable are not two mutually exclusive things. Right. It can be both. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not a zero-sum game. Uh, number two, uh, I think yeah, this is going to sound a bit defensive, but hear me out. Um, when the manif- I was part of the, the, the machinery that went into producing the Buku Harapan, uh, in fact, it was the youth wing, uh, Pemuda Pakatan Harapan, who actually f- fired the first salvo where we had our Tawaran Harapan, of which pretty much 99% of what we put in Tawaran Harapan actually went into the Buku Harapan. So, um, but the, 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 the fact is, what we need to realize is we didn't have enough data, we didn't have access to information that fully informs us in what we wrote. That is both an admission of failure, but also an admission uh, and also a critique on the lack of transparency in information and the structures in which uh, pu- public policy is debated because you can't really debate unless you're fully informed. If you're not fully informed, whatever debating points that you bring to the table are at best superficial sometimes. But And superficial and ideological. When you put an ideological argument about what you want without the 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 real data behind it it becomes super, superficial right right so which is why very often you hear people say that oh ideological arguments are, are pointless because you know it's superficial because mm. you are not informed by the truth not informed by data to a certain extent i i, I have to admit that buku harapan to a certain light extent was that uh, the third part of my response to that is whatever uh, tun mahade said then well we disagreed Mm-hmm. DAP disagreed strongly in public and behind closed doors in Majish President as well as you know within our party conventions. We made it very clear we disagreed absolutely and totally. 
right? Uh, because it's quite frankly, I hate using that term. It's stupid to say that. Right. It's stupid to think that. A manifesto is your commitment to those who want to vote for you, right? Now, let me make it clear. I didn't say he was stupid. That right. comment is stupid. Yep. All right. So, and and for me, I'd, I'd like to kind of mirror what I've been said. Uh, yes, to a certain extent, manifestos uh, are not the be all and end all, but it is the basis of which we gain trust and, well, canvas for votes, mm -hmm. because this is what you're asking them to give you an opportunity to do in government. And for me, that has to come with, uh, I don't want to use that term, you know, don't kill me for saying, you need to condition the electorate to know and understand what you're offering. I mean, I've been talking about the care economy since 2014, uh, because Perak was already an aging state at that right. time, and it's something that we have to face. You know, I'm not going to go into the details of why, but you're an aging state, so you need to have an aging nation and an aging state's responsive policies to, to help people in need of care. Because the more aged you are as a, as a community, the, more, the higher likelihood of you needing care in the community. So that's one. So care economy. Tivet. Well, I'm a Tivet professional. I've never been to university, I don't have a degree, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not one of these professionals, but actually, Am I a substandard human just because I don't have a professional degree and I'm not a doctor, an engineer, what a mechanic or whatever? You know, why should I not have equal standing in society? I always tell people that, uh, and this is part of the conditioning, uh, an ideological conditioning, that an advanced just society is not advanced and just until a baker and a chef earns equally or nearly as much as a doctor or a lawyer. Why? Because only then, for me, that is a just and equal society. And until you achieve that, you are not a just or an advanced society because you have to be just in order to be advanced. Right. Right. So why do we not have a really all-encompassing education that includes and mainstreams and puts TVET, technical and vocation uh, professionals, the same place and the same level of social understanding and social accreditation with other professionals. So Tivet mainstream is something that you need to condition and we need to condition the people, the masses, as well as those who are rich as the capitalists to understand. Because if they don't understand, they're not going to give the wages, right? So you need to condition everyone. So Tivet, uh, I mean, social housing, climate change, climate change is affecting housing policies because actually there are people losing their homes right. literally on the on a daily basis because of you know rising amount of um you know wind uh, incidents that you know fell trees and trees fall on people's homes and people lose homes because of climate change what are we doing about that why aren't we bringing ppr in situ to people or to places where people need housing right so this is the kind of conditioning that needs to come hand in hand with manifestos because manifestos is a promise, but in order for people to understand what is behind and the intent and the agenda behind those promises, people need to understand the real issues behind it. But here's the thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Arvin, I want to get your thoughts on this. The, sure. the, the fact of the matter is um, manifestos are not legally binding, mm. um, you know, contracts, mm -hmm. right? We cannot sue the government. Um, you know, you come into power and then you didn't fulfill promise number two and so I'm going to sue you for X amount and things. You can't, yeah. right? Because it's not legally binding. So given that, you know, Malaysians have had past experiences where, let's say, um, certain, uh, you know, previous administrations said, you know, we're going to do this, but maybe they didn't fulfill 100% and, and so on and so forth. I'm wondering what, do you tell people who say, why should I care? Why should I care about manifestos? It is, I, you know, it's not, you can just say anything. Before elections, I can say, I'm going to give you the world. Mm -hmm. And then after elections, I'm, you know, I'm just going to help the ultra wealthy. I think um, I go back to the weaknesses of the system that we have now. We have to admit that there is such an alienation. When I say alienation, there is a separation of the common voter from uh, those that they represent. In Sheraton Move, there was no laws that were broken. You know, 222 right. people talked amongst themselves. They say, hey, you want power? Or I want power, basically. But and it wasn't they, 222, la. it was a small group. La. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> my, my apologies. Uh, actually, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. But uh, they, uh, this smaller group of smaller than 222 people talked and then decided amongst and themselves. And there was some aduns also. There was some aduns also. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the main point is uh, we see that the structures that we have today are failing. And so we have to build, as I said before, alternative structures. In Gabungan Marheim, which is our front, we build unions, we build, we have unions actually. Uh, we uh, uh, bring together people who are marginalized. We have Orangasli groups, we have Mahasiswa groups, and they all come together in solidarity to fight for the things that they want. This is the type of thing that we need to build. It's called, uh, Lenin called it dual power. These kind of organizations, as they grow, and Mar- Gabungan Marhain is growing, Uh, stronger and stronger and stronger, then the masses who individually are powerless because they don't have capital uh, against their political elite or the business elite, they can then threaten uh, themselves to not vote for you or even better, they can threaten not to go to work, strikes, right? Uh, to uh, make sure that they achieve what they want to achieve, you see. Um, so... That's the thing, essentially. Um, alternative power structures are the only thing that is going to work. And we are very serious in building that. Other than that, it's very difficult to hold people uh, accountable. Howard, you know, let's say a government comes into power, right? Um, and uh, what what can the Raya do to keep this government who, let's say, broke a manifesto, um, broke some promises, whether it's a few promises, whether it's all the promise, maybe their manifesto implied that they're a leftist government, Uh, they're going to be a leftist government, they come into government suddenly right-wing, for example, things like that. Um, Let's say I'm a fan-sitter, or Ali, you know, or Abu Achong is a fan-sitter. He voted for, since I'm asking you, let's just say Pakatan Harapan, um, because Pakatan Harapan promised to abolish tolls and sedition act, for example. And then Ali is now sitting one month, two months, ten months, twenty months. It's not been abolished. Mm. What can Ali do? Well, I'm going to throw a really crazy idea into the mix here. Actually, manifestos can be legislated. Mm. So let's say, for example, uh, the first sitting of uh, parliament straight after the elections, the prime minister or the party or the MP who managed to get the majority uh, to to rule or be the prime minister, a set of cabinet and to be the government for the forthcoming five years or below, uh, will table a bill to parliament listing out the things that he or she wants to do uh, as government in line with the manifesto. Now, that idea is not impossible and it's not that crazy. But is it legally doable? Because you, it's like a, a, a mega legislation. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. It's a mega legislation like, you know, you've got the, you know, the, the no, normally each and every single policy that you want to bring in, uh, you will pro- it will probably involve like amendment of four, five, six, seven, eight different types of existing legislation right. and a mother bill. Right, but to legislate a big—I was going to nearly swear there—but <laughs> <laughs> a big something bit of legislation like that, mm-hmm. it's technically doable. Right, but is it practical? No. So to say that one uh, to to make it legally binding. Is it impossible? No, it's not impossible. But it takes a lot more lawyer hours than it's worth to do that. Right. Uh, but this is where the real pragmatic, uh, the real pragmatic uh, part of me comes out and say that look, this is what democracy is for, right? You give them four years for them to achieve as much of what they wanted to achieve in the first place, and if they succeed in 60% and fail in 40, then you only give them 60 points or 60 seats or 60 votes as opposing to the 100 votes or 100 seats or 100 points. Does it work like that in reality? No. Right. It doesn't, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm not sulking, but the fact is, to say that Pakatan Harapan, and I'm, I'm dipping into a, a critique that um, I don't think is unfair because factually we didn't deliver a lot of what we wanted. But the fact is, for what for us to deliver 100% on what was in the Buku Harapan, well, we thought, we thought we didn't, 
we thought we had four years and a half at the very least. Right. But we only had 22. We didn't even have a full two years, for heaven's sake. Right. So one cannot judge the Pakatan Harapan government in saying that we didn't deliver because we didn't have the time. Right. But are the voter, uh, the voters and the electorate wrong in saying we didn't factually wrong in we didn't deliver everything that we said? Yeah, of course they're right. Right. Because we didn't. So... Arvin, yes. you know, okay, let's just say, you okay. know, we, we've seen, uh, I, I've seen PSM's uh, manifesto, what y'all push for, sure. you know, we, we do a show together and things like that, mm -hmm. right? So, we know you've described what P PSM's ideology is um, and, and things like that. So, let's say something um, something happens, magic, anything, let's mm. say G15 PSM wins, okay. wins big. Like, yeah, don't say magic. Sure. Nah. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. let's just say PSM wins okay. big. Okay, okay. Fair enough. PSM yeah. becomes the government. Okay. okay. And now all the, let's say, very, um, you know, very left, leftist ideas, the, the very serious taxations mm. that y'all want to impose on the ultra wealthy sure. um, and all these things, right? Once y'all come to government, y'all say, okay, la, we actually, you know, did our calculations as government. Mm. Okay, I don't think it's realistic to, you know, um, to really carry out or implement all our ideas. Mm. If that happens, mm. that means you're, you broke your manifesto's promises. Mm. What can the people do? It's that, because it's not legally binding. Okay, two things lah. One thing that won't happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> you know, mainly because the manifestos that we write, when you go through them, we don't, uh, uh, most of the things that we wrote there, we get from the masses and they're very uh, achievable because we've achieved it already. We talk about getting houses. We've already gotten houses outside of parliament. We know we can do it. Right. You know, uh, we talk about reforming land laws. We've already done it. You know, we've gotten uh, land for our Orangasti comrades and our farmer comrades. These are possible things. We've already done them and we only put it in the manifesto uh, if we can uh, achieve them. But of course, there are some aspirational things in there like taxation. Uh, it's very difficult to achieve uh, to, for us to make that mistake but let's say we have made the mistake we also include uh, within our manifesto uh, certain clauses uh, that uh, that makes us as government weaker things like recall elections things like uh, Majlis Perundingan Rakyat so Majlis Perundingan Rakyat is uh, mass meetings that every single PSM representative must have by uh, by uh, in our party uh, to get uh, all of the electorate as much as they can la, in their area together to discuss what they have achieved, what their weaknesses are, what the people there uh, want, and the people can then voice uh, voice out and criticize them. There needs to be deep structural reforms. I'm not saying that, uh, what do you call that, automatically, you know, you change the person, suddenly the whole thing changes. Right. No, 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 no. You have to change the, the structure. And we, at, we in PSM are committed and are very serious about changing the structure. That's why it is very, uh, that's why you should not compromise so much. When you compromise, uh, uh, what do you call that? When you, when you give in to compromise, suddenly you have so many people in your party who don't like uh, the others and then break away to form another faction. Lah. What to do? You have to be careful in that sense, basically. That's why I said, when you're in a river, you have to go against the tide. Cannot slow down or else you'll be taken by the tide. Right. Okay. So, Can I yes. just jump yes. in there? Please jump no, in. Go ahead. Well, actually, not compromising causes parties to split even more. Mm. Not us. <laughs> not us, though. No, no, no. I'm telling you from experience. Look at the leftist movement. Look at the first international. Look at the second international. Mm -hmm. Look at the progressive alliance. Look at the socialist international. Yes. This is our family. Of course. The reason why there's so many splits over the course of the last 150 years is because, well, the first few, I would say, uh, incarnations mm -hmm. of our mother bodies at the international. We are internationalists, but mm -hmm. the fact is, the internationalist bodies mm -hmm. in the past have been so uncompromising, it has become splits. Mm -hmm. What so, I mean, mm -hmm. I, uh, whilst I don't I disagree understand. with yeah, you, but yeah. I, I think the notion that not compromising uh, will, I mean, compromising causes split actually is absolutely the opposite. Mm -hmm. And yet, I stand, I sit here uh, next to uh, Howard Lee, who's uh, PH compromised with Mahade and they have split. 
that's what i'm saying when i'm talking about not compromising i'm talking about the core values do not sell them away just because you want to get into power what to do actually how that's and, an, and, that's and, an interesting point right mm-hmm. i i do want to uh, because i think you bring up a very good point as well about how you know when we see a lot of times on a global level it is compromise on the left that leads them to victory mm-hmm. a lot of time um, uncompromising um, or pe- you know people who don't want to compromise can you mm-hmm. know it, you know it just results in e- election victory for the right wing mm-hmm. parties but on the separate side i think he brings up a good point about mm-hmm. how compromising can also lead to downfall mm-hmm. and how ca- compromising certain values uh, compromising um, you know with people that you uh, perhaps uh, you know don't share ideological similarities with and, and things like that and and on that front i said isn't it better to you know be uncompromising mm. but take the very long arduous road with 200 more hills to climb mm. uh, but eventually in the long run get a solid you know you know you change society the way society thinks and, and you get a so- more solid victory rather than making compromises as you go along Okay, it depends on who you're speaking to. Mm-hmm. If you're speaking to a fellow a fellow ideologue, of course it's non-compromise because that's the only way forward. But the fact that if you go down to the ground and speak to people, they just want policies delivered for their lives, right? I'll give you an example. If I was non uncompromising, um straight up straight as we straight after government fell straight after Lanka Sheraton, it was essentially the literally the scars that weren't even scars yet. The, the the wounds were still we weren't even licking it was still bleeding mm. right anything that had to do with the government and the new government formed um if we were uncompromising we wouldn't even have anything to do with them at the state level but the fact is at that time we were facing multiple crises a healthcare crisis a housing crisis a climate crisis you know we were having literally tornadoes happening in my constituency people weren't getting vaccines etc etc If I was not compro- if I was com- uncompromising, I wouldn't have gone into the pajabat da era. I wouldn't have gone to the uh, exco for health. I wouldn't have had those conversations, those difficult meetings to say, look, I'm opposition now. You've got the power. I'm asking you to give me an opportunity, to give me the power to at least not hold on to your power, so that I can go and help those people in my constituency who need vaccines. Compromise brought me vaccines. Compromise enabled me to bring help to people rather than sitting there screaming and shouting about help not being delivered being delivered to the people. That's compromising. I'm not talking about compromising my values. I'm talking about compromising in a si- situation so that I can get done. Sorry, I saw no, that. It's okay. I mean, I completely agree. We have some making life difficult yeah. for the editors. Yeah. <laughs> no, we uh, we do the same as well. Uh, you know, we compromise the same dabi, we get houses yeah. or what I'm saying is don't compromise your values, the right. core essentially. Since when have we ever said we compromise on values? Uh, we can talk about that for a long time. Yes, and I think that is a rather interesting debate that we probably yeah. can have another time, but yeah. you know, just circling back to manifestos before we wrap up this conversation, mm-hmm. I just like to get some final thoughts from each of you all. Um how important important our manifestos and also um, if y'all already have manifestos or are coming up with manifesto soon y'all can perhaps uh, talk about where people can look out for that look out for that as well so I'm starting with you Arvin uh in spite of all the challenges and there have been many um uh, with uh, BN PN PH all PSM has grown and uh, we are committed to our cause we are very serious about building the the masses our manifesto will reflect that uh, it will reflect our uh, kita minta lima um, um, campaign that we have and uh, we have strong pillars asking for housing healthcare jobs guarantee scheme etc uh, look out for it we are drafting it uh, currently and once we have finished drafted it we will launch it you can find it in our party's website partysocialist.org and all of our social media at party socialist thank you so much for your time and how it um reflecting on what uh, arvin said just now about conditioning uh, the electorate uh, it's already happening we already t- we as in dap have already started talking about uh, discussing publicly debating what we are demanding or putting on the table in the manifesto committee discussions uh, within ph uh, discussions are being had public debate is being riled up as we speak and uh, the manifesto 
uh, it wouldn't be the word manifesto that would be used. It would be an action plan, a post election action plan uh, in less wordy and less thick mm. and less paper being used to print uh, a, an action plan for if and when we become government after the next general election, what we will do in a much more simplified, uh, much more minimalistic, but much more meaningful way, uh, not only in accordance to voter segmentation, but in addressing the structural systemic issues of the country that we have today. And on that note, Howard, Arvind, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. I've been speaking to Howard Lee. He's the Adon for Pasir Pinji and the member of a, of the DAP. And Arvind Kadri Chilvan, he's the Youth Chief for Party Socialist Malaysia, PSM. If you'd like to check out other episodes on the series and other content like this, you can also head over to our YouTube channel. Just search BFM 89.9. And this show is also available on podcasts, which you can check out on the BFM app, bfm.my, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Dashan Johan, and this has been Road to GE on Beyond the Ballot Box. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye-bye.